It says the women compared timestamped screenshots of texts and assembled there in an extraordinary record of deception. There was a day in Texas when, after Sarah left his hotel, Andrew slept with Mary and texted Eve. They found days in which he would text nearly identical pictures of himself to two of them at the same time. They realized that day before, that the day before he had moved in with Sarah in Berkeley, he had slept with Mary and he had also been with her in December of 2023, the weekend before Sarah caught him on the couch with the sixth woman. So this kind of coincides perfectly talking about Diddy. Rashad Crenshaw in the chat just brought it up. What are my thoughts on Diddy? You know, really quickly, because I'm not ready to dive into it, but how it correlates with Andrew Huberman. People will say, what does it matter what Andrew Huberman does in his personal life? How does it impact his work? What does it matter what Diddy does in his personal life? Well, sometimes work and personal life don't tend to be that separate. And so as much as we think, oh, I can separate my personal life from my work life, doesn't seem to be true for human beings. People have a really hard time doing that. I remember in the 90s when Bill Clinton was president and he basically took advantage of Monica Lewinsky. One of the things that Republicans would say is if he's going to cheat on his wife, he's going to cheat on the country. And to be honest with you, I think think it's over time become clear that maybe the Clintons aren't the most upstanding people, but I mean, is any politician, right? There's something to be said about what does it matter? What somebody is doing in their personal life? What does it matter? What someone's doing behind closed doors? What matters more? What they're saying out loud or what they're doing where no one is looking? Why does it matter if people are chronically cheating or lying or gaslighting their partners as long as what they're saying on stream is correct? Well, it's like, okay, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Sometimes I do think if you're a cheater, that shouldn't impact your work. And sometimes that's true. But other times, if you're gaslighting, chronically cheating, spreading STIs, well, maybe that will impact your work. Maybe it might even make you more biased during your podcasts or might make you uh, more inclined to research something a little less honest. If you've got a person who's making content saying gay people are evil and they're predators and they're, you know, grooming children and then you find out they're fucking men behind closed doors, don't you think it kind of matters what they're doing in their personal life? Now, I agree if you're a school teacher, it probably doesn't matter that you're gay and therefore your personal life doesn't impact work. And in that way, of course, your personal life isn't going to impact work. Oh, you're a sex worker, but also a teacher. Well, that shouldn't impact work unless you're a freak. Oh, you're, you know, you have a polyamorous relationship or lifestyle. Well, that shouldn't matter if you're a politician. Oh, you're like, you know, as long as everything is done in good effort, as long as everything's done in dignity, as long as everything is done in good faith. Now, like Diddy, Andrew Huberman isn't just being accused of being a hoe. He's being accused of violating consent. Bill Clinton wasn't just a hoe. He fucked or more orally sexed an intern, somebody who was below him, totally inappropriate given his status as president. So obviously in these situations, we're talking about issues of consent, not issues of hobaggery. Nobody cares if Diddy's gay or a hoe. Nobody cares that Andrew Huberman's a hoe. Nobody cares that Bill Clinton's a hoe. We care on who you're hoeing with and what, what ways you've violated their consent. Andrew Huberman is violating consent in a way that is questionable in a way that we should raise an eyebrow. Now, of course, my mother would say, and I think my mother's right on this, this is why we cannot worship celebrities. They're humans and they're gonna be flawed. So obviously Andrew Huberman's a flawed person. So if you guys are unaware, New York Mag came out with an expose on Andrew Huberman. I did read the whole thing. I did pay for the dollar to get behind the paywall and it's really good. If you disagree with it, fine. But I think it's interesting the kinds of ways people are supporting him. And they keep saying, what does it matter what he does in his personal life? Well, when it comes to his work, maybe nothing. But don't you think it kind of matters in general when we're worshiping or being fans of someone? Don't you think it would be a big deal if a controversy came out that Jordan Peterson was diddling kids or he was cheating on Tammy? Don't you think that'd be kind of important? And if you don't think that's important, that's interesting because I feel like you're telling on yourself. I feel like you might be the problem. Now, again, nobody is perfect. But the thing that stood out to me as I'm reading this Andrew Huberman article is that he has done one specific thing that I think is the most telling and that he has lied to his partners, de uh, moved the blame away from his own actions onto them. He's lied chronically, gaslit them, and spread STIs. That's a pretty big deal. You know what I mean? In my personal opinion. Now, I'm a Huberman fan. I actually promote him quite often. I actually say Huberman's name pretty frequently. I watch Andrew Huberman. So I'm a little annoyed that another man 
is a sex pest. I am very annoyed. And you know, I try to stay as neutral as possible. But given everything that's happened, given all the text messages that were shared, the recordings they had of him, and the fact that even his defenders are saying, so what, he had five girlfriends. No, no, no. He didn't just have five girlfriends. He was sleeping with five different women, one of which he was in a long-term relationship with and living with, one of which he was doing IVF treatments with, trying to get pregnant, one of which he gave HPV to and probably all of his partners, one of which he denied having HPV, even though it's very unlikely to get tested in men. Okay, he didn't have five girlfriends. He had five separate women that were under an illusion that he was a monogamous, committed or non or casual relationships with him. Okay, it's not that Andrew Huberman had five girlfriends. He had five women he was stringing along. He had five women he was convincing were important to him. We're going to have kids with him. We're going to have a life with him. He even mentioned to multiple women, our kids would be beautiful together. Even his male friends said that Andrew is a flake. He was known as inconsistent. He was known as hard to reach. Fine, sounds annoying. But I do think what he did to these women should be questioned and we should raise an eyebrow. I do think if you're a man spreading STIs, I think if you're a woman spreading STIs, I think that's wrong. Get tested. Stop sleeping with these men that are openly bragging about cheating on women, openly bragging about like, I'm gonna do it no matter what. Stop doing this to yourselves. Conrad says denying an STD isn't illegal. Knowingly spreading an STD is illegal in some states. Well, the dilemma is that if you're a man, you're less likely to get tested for HPV. It's harder for it to come up. But for the women who contract it, I have HPV. Or it's hard to say because I have the vaccine now and so it doesn't show up on my testing. But I remember getting HPV and I was like, what the fuck? And it was my male partner who had given it to three of his female partners. And the dilemma with that is like, it's not testable in men. It's very rare for it to show up on men's tests. So Andrew Huberman, yes, allegedly got tested according to the article and he doesn't have it, but of course he doesn't have it. That's exactly what's normal. <laughs> like, yes, I know you don't have it. And so like you carry the strain, but that doesn't mean you don't have it. It's like, it doesn't show up on the test, which is not the same thing. Not showing up on the test and not having it are not the same thing. So yes, it doesn't show up on this, the paperwork, but you're the only one these women have been with because all these women were under the illusion you were monogamous with them. So basically what happens is he's dating primarily a woman named Sarah, not her real name. And for six years, they're having an up and down relationship. It's quite ten tension filled. It's a little awkward. Her friends aren't the happiest for her. You know, not everybody really likes Andrew, but she really sees determined to be with him. The five women are all Girl bosses, successful, run, work out, care about what they eat. They're, they all have their own jobs. And Andrew's one of the kinds of men that these women are more likely to end up with, right? He's successful. He's educated. Him and his dad are both Stanford alumni. He's, uh, he's a smart guy, you know? Regardless of some of the dude bro science on his podcast, for the most part, he does also invite incredibly educated and proper guests to come talk about their fields of interest. So Andrew, for the most part, seems like a really good person, right? He talks about how discipline is necessary. Alcohol is bad for you. He's helped so many people, so many men, right? And I think that's beautiful, bro. I think it's beautiful that he's helped so many people. That doesn't mean I'm not going to judge him for the way that he's mistreated women the way he lied, spread his TIs, and abused his status as their alleged partners by gaslighting and lying to them. Sarah, the six-year partner, caught him cheating twice. He confessed it in a journal, and she found text messages on her phone, on his phone, on his phone. Okay, Sarah should have left after the first time. Should have left after the, after the second time. She should have left. She should have left, but she didn't. She had two kids from a prior relationship. She was eagerly hoping that the man she married was the man that you saw in those podcasts, was a considerate, loving, upstanding person. But instead, he was a man who was juggling, gaslighting, and lying to five different women in order to maintain whatever image of himself he needed to maintain. I think you should treat people with dignity. But if your morals say that you're allowed to cheat, then don't listen to Britney. If your morals say it's okay to pick up young and traumatized women and quote, save them, fine, cool, great. Don't listen to Britney. If your morals say you can spread STIs, fine. 
What the fuck do I know? Cool. If your morals say you'll let a woman take the hit for your bad decisions, even though you are absolutely a contributing factor in this, cool. Love that. You do that. I just think it's shitty behavior. So for people saying, oh, we've all had things, we've all done things in our past, not like this. Not like this. Okay, and maybe we have, but we should be the first ones to come out and say, it's not okay. See how people say, oh, we've all done things in our past. That's not a justification. I love Sneeko, and I think he might grow into a very mature man one day. Do not date him. He will mistreat you. He is bad to women. He is an unsafe sexual partner. <laughs> he is an unsafe emotional partner. He's an unsafe, how many times do I have to say it? And this is someone who knows him a little bit, a little bit through work. But you won't believe me. And you'll go to save him and you'll think I'm the one. Same with Andrew Huberman. There's going to be a woman who's going to see this article and go, nah, I can save him. My pussy can save him, bro. I'm not saying these people are evil. I'm saying, why don't you listen to them when they tell you who they are? Because somehow in your brain you think, yeah, but I really like them. Cool, you can like them, you can be friends with them, you can hang out with them, you can promote their work. That doesn't mean you can, you should go and put your reputation in vouching for them as partners. I have very, very complicated relationships with people in my life. Love them. Also, don't want my reputation to be, I don't want to vouch for my friends in that way. My friends, like, they cheat. Some of them sleep with married people. I love them. But no, if you ask me, should you date them? No. But people think, oh, if you're their friend, you'll, you'll support them no matter what. I do support you as a human being on the planet who's flawed. I do not want people asking me, do you think it's safe to date this person? And then me saying yes. And then him fucking you over when I know he will do that. Don with the super chest says, my morals told me to give you 69 schmeckles. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm rooting for all these people to get better over the years. But I'm not going to vouch for them. Amy says, if you can't vouch for your friends, that's a problem. I don't think so. I disagree. I believe in everyone's ability to be their own, the, their own selves on their own journey. I'm not saying Andrew Huberman's an evil guy. But I'm saying like, yeah, this absolutely, this definitely brings into question uh, his relationship with discipline, with honesty, with transparency, right? So I don't care that my friends are different from me. I don't care that you're morally different. I mean, I have very diverse friends. If you want diversity to be in the world, kids, it means they don't agree with you. They don't do life the way you would do life. There are people I know who literally think Trump is a sexual predator, but not Bill Clinton. Fine. I don't like that. So it says, I think you can vouch for aspects of your friends. You can know where they're reliable and where they're not. Exactly. My friends are mostly 99% reliable. It's just in some areas they're not. My siblings are 99% reliable. Just in some areas they're not. You know, like my friends are their own individual consciousness. Like I'm not here. You know what I mean? To dictate their morals. Like we don't have the same morals. Why would we? Half, half my siblings are pro-life. Why would we have the same morals? Half my siblings are religious. Why, why would we have the same morals? Morals are specific to you, an individual, the consciousness. As this comes out, how will Andrew Huberman's friends react? Will Lex Friedman support him? Will Jordan Peterson support him? Will they have good relationships? Or will they be like, hey, you need to be better? Everyone's having a different relationship with these things. Like I said, my inner circle is my inner circle. If they killed somebody, I would report them to the cops and still visit them in prison. You can love a person for who they are, and not what they do. I don't like the things most people do. That doesn't mean I don't love you. And I think people who don't understand that just haven't like experienced unconditional love, right? Hayda says Huberman got questionable discipline for real. Sexual discipline is part of the physical discipline. So I was surprised when I saw the article. Well, that's the thing. It's like he brags about being this disciplined person. And then when asked about his vices, forgets to mention, uh, you know, his sexual deviancy. And that's because people don't want to look at themselves like the villain. They're not ready to admit it. They'll say it casually or maybe they'll even admit it, but they're never really ready to see themselves as the truly flawed person they are. So it's hard to meet them there. You know what I mean? This is a, let me make sure you guys can see it. Okay, so this is a supporter of Andrew Huberman. I want you to see his logic. This is Alex Finn. I don't know who that is. He says, this is everything what's wrong with 2024. New York Magazine came out with a hit piece on Andrew Huberman, a guy known to spread helpful, digestible scientific information. That's true. Huberman's podcasts are really good. They're not perfect. No one is. And sometimes he has kooks on. 
But for the most part, he has pretty good, uh, pretty good information. He does, right? No problem. Did they attack him because he was unethical? No, they attacked him because this line here. Did they attack him because he was unethical? What do you think that means? Do you think it's ethical to have a person in your society running around, spreading STIs, endangering women, gaslighting them? Like, is that ethical? He says, no, they attacked him because he showed up late for a Thanksgiving dinner one time. Okay, that's an interesting reading of the conversation. Basically, he was meeting Sarah's parents and instead of showing up, made excuses why he couldn't make it after many, many hours of them waiting for him to show up. Okay, she should have dumped him then and there, but she didn't right? It wasn't just he showed up late to a Thanksgiving dinner. He didn't go. He made an excuse and never showed up, which was a pattern they were showing with even his male friends, right? Two, he had a bunch of girlfriends. He did not have a bunch of girlfriends. He was lying, gaslighting, and manipulating multiple women in order to keep them off the market in his attempt at his like beck and call and they had no clue that what they were consenting to because he broke their consent they all thought they were monogamous he talked about having kids with them with multiples of them i'm not sure if all five of them but multiples of them he didn't have girlfriends he maybe had girlfriends but they didn't know that he was actively lying to these women so kind of weird three he took a athletic greens as a sponsor okay so some people have problems with that i don't care lots of sponsors are bullshit uh athletic greens is like kind of controversial. Some people hate it. Some people love it. Don't care. Four, he cared about his dog too much. That's a funny way to tell that story. I agree that that part of the story was just showing a pattern of behavior. People found him snippy. People found him like very difficult to deal with. Family and friends didn't like his vibe. Um, they wanted to support his partners in dating him, Sarah specifically, but they didn't like how he seemed to prioritize his dog over his girlfriend, which is fine. He villainizes alcohol. Obviously, that wasn't the problem the article was having with Andrew Huberman, right? So when you do this and you twist the narrative like this, like that obviously wasn't the problem. Now, this guy doesn't think he did anything unethical. So if you don't think he, him gaslighting and spreading STIs and manipulating multiple women isn't unethical, fine. Then we, different bubbles, right? We disagree on what's ethical. Someone said, I mean, he does, he did have five girlfriends at once and gaslit them all into thinking they were the only ones. Other than that, yeah, this is what Loop said. Alex said, what is any of our business though? What is that any of our business? Does every person in America who has ever cheated deserve a public hit piece on them? I mean, in my world, kind of, yeah. Also, why make so much of the article here say about how he showed up late to Thanksgiving and how flaky he is? Shows it wasn't written in good faith. That's not what the point of the article was. The point of the article is to show a pattern of behavior where he uses people, networks with them, keeps them in good grace, and then uses and abuses their time. Now, you can think that's not a big deal, but who cares? <clears throat> this person I saw as, on a reply said, I respect him even more after this article. I looked up this guy's profile. He goes, grew up poor, became a millionaire. Watch me operate my one-person business and share everything I learned along the way. Do what others won't. Jarek Lewis. Cool. It's like a type of person that is into this bubble that is like supporting him. It's fine. You can do that. I'm just trying to say we all live in different bubbles and we all have different ways of communicating. If one of my brothers was doing this to women, I would tell the women. I would be like, hey, don't date my brother. He's like a serial cheater and he's lying and he's probably narcissistic. I would do that. And I love my brothers. But if one of them was doing this to women, you bet your ass I'm calling all those women. I might even make a YouTube video about it for fun. But probably not because my brothers aren't public figures. He's a public figure. That's why it's a public article, dummy. The idea of like, why is this, why is he being, because he's a public fucking figure. He's working for Stanford. And if Stanford is happy having this guy on their team, fine. But think about that. If this was my brother, I would tell the women involved, like, do not date my brother. I love him. Do not date him. Right? And some of you all think, what? I would protect my brother? Why? Why would I protect a serial cheater? Why would I protect people like that? That makes no fucking sense. It makes no sense. Now, if the victims involved for some reason were like, hey, can you not tell anyone about this except other victims? Sure. Andrew Huberman sells you a narrative that he has figured out something that has made him basically perfect right? And he hasn't. He's dealing with a really big demon and he's not willing to face it. 
So I prefer people who walk the walk. You can absolutely still support Andrew. It's left a bad taste in my mouth. I don't like people who can't walk the walk. I don't like people who can't be honest that they can't walk the walk. If Andrew came out and genuinely said, hey, this is something I'm struggling with. I am weak. I am a horrible person. I've done these things. All of this. You know what I mean? That's that's impressive to me. For all of Jordan, Jordan Peterson's faults, and I think he has many in his like ideas, I cannot say that he doesn't walk the walk. He's good to Tammy. He's a good father. He's a good husband. He tries his best to live within his morals. I couldn't say that Jordan Peterson doesn't walk the walk in that regard, right? As far as I know, he's actually really, actually, I kind of feel like Jordan Peterson hinted at this months ago because Jordan did a conversation about Tate and he said a lot of the guys in the sphere with podcasts are not good husbands, not good partners. And I can't remember the context and I saw that. But now I'm wondering if he was talking about Hugh Mervin too. I wonder, because Jordan was saying a lot of the men in this space are not good with women. And now I'm wondering if he knew about Andrew Huberman already. You know? So again, don't pedestal your content creators. Don't pedestal me or anyone else. I personally, as a viewer though, do prefer to watch people that walk the walk. You know? He just says, I don't think he should lose his job. His science communication is fine, but his life advice is sus. Yeah, I think if Stanford doesn't want somebody who like gaslights women on their payroll, I think that's kind of fine, right? Because that could mean something more about his job. But I do think that he's probably fine when it comes to his science stuff, right? Um, I think the article tried to insinuate that he's not fully as well-versed in his field as they say, but I mean they didn't give as much evidence to that. I think what's really important here is that he's the type of man who gaslights women and that sucks. Like that's just like a really not a, good people just don't do that guys. I'm so sorry. Healthy, well-adjusted people don't cheat and lie on their partners. And those aren't people I want to be around. So they're also not people that I really want to support. I'm okay if people have been years away from something if they have a different relationship with something, I'm okay listening to Andrew Huberman if he has a good guest on. It's just like, you know, when you say like, I'm a fan of someone, wait, what are you saying? Are you a fan of them or their work? Like, even when it comes to books, I'm always nervous to recommend books to people because it sounds like I'm supporting the author or something. I'm just saying this book gave me this tool. I don't care who wrote it. I'm not like, I just want to get the tool I want to get. I love Harry Potter. Does that mean I have to love JK Rowling? Like, no. Do I like J.K. Rowling? No, I can't stand her in interviews anymore. I used to love J.K. Rowling. I used to literally love her little like behind the scenes story about her life because I related it to it so much. And now I can't stand her because like she's just too weird about trans people. And again, I'm not saying she's a bad, evil person, but she is. For me, I think too hateful as a person. I don't really think that's a good quality to have in a person. I don't like very hateful people. I don't like cheaters. I don't like people who don't walk the walk. I don't like conservatives who make a living off talking bad about LGBT people only to end up LGBT people. Like, I just don't like it. I don't like priests that fuck little kids. I don't like people that, you know, I just don't like it. But if you want to watch Andrew Huberman and get a tool from him, I think that's great. I wonder what's going to happen with Lex. I wonder what's going to, what's he going to say? Obviously, if he wants to still be friends with him, and still support him as a friend. I totally understand that. I support my friends even when they're being pieces of shit. I don't don't support their actions. So I've said Loki Shapiro seems like a lovely husband too from everything I've seen. True. Absolutely. For all the shit I disagree with Ben Shapiro on, he does seem to be a good husband and a good father. Check his post out. Did, did Lex put out a post? It's heartbreaking to see a hit piece written about my friend Andrew Huberman. I know him very well and I can defin definitively say that this is a great human being, scientist, and educator. Hit piece attacks like this are simply trash. Clickbait journalism desperately clinging onto relevance. Andrew should be celebrated, period. His podcast has helped millions of people, including me, lead healthier lives. Keep growing, brother. I don't understand why you keep calling it a hit piece. I'm very confused. Recordings. 
text messages, everything was verified. So is the part where he gaslit five women, is that the good part of him? Hades says, aren't hit piece lies? Can it be a hit piece if it's true? That's what I'm saying, it's true. So if it's true, then what are we doing? Mantis says, I mean, could it be lies and exaggerations? Okay, so I have the article, I can't show it to you guys, it's behind a paywall. It could be fake, but it'd be very weird for it to be fake. Like all of them are fake, all the text messages, all the women, all the people. I mean, it could be fake, but I don't understand how it could be fake also. It says the women compared timestamped screenshots of texts and assembled there in an extraordinary record of deception. There was a day in Texas when after Sarah left his hotel, Andrew slept with Mary and texted Eve. They found days in which he would text nearly identical pictures of himself to two of them at the same time. They realized that day before that the day before he had moved in with Sarah in Berkeley. He had slept with Mary and he had also been with her in December of 2023, the weekend before Sarah caught him on the couch with the sixth woman. They realized on March 21st, 2021, a day of admittedly impressive logistical jiu-jitsu while Sarah was in Berkeley, Andrew had flown Mary from Texas to L.A. to stay with him in Topanga. While Mary was there visiting from thousands of miles away, he left her with Costello. He drove to a coffee shop where he, where he met Eve. They all had serious talks about their relationship. They all thought they were in a good place. He wanted to make it work. Phone died, he texted Mary who was waiting back at the place in Topanga and later to Eve, thank you for being so next, next level gorgeous and sexy. Sleep well, beautiful, he texted Sarah. The scheduling alone, Alex tells me. I can barely schedule three Zooms in a day. And in aggregate, Andrew's therapeutic language took a sinister edge. It was a communi it was communicating a, commu a commitment that was not real, a profound interest in the internality of the women, internality of the women that was then used to manipulate them. <laughs> Does Huberman have vices? Asked an anonymous Reddit poster. I remember him saying, reads the first comment, that he loves croissants. That's pretty funny to me. Okay. So again, if you don't think cheating is a big deal, if you don't think this says anything about him, it, you know what I mean? Bad news says, how is Huberman a sex pest if these women willingly hooked up with him? It's the fact that he lied to them about him being single, lied to them about being monogamous, lied to them about having HPV because it didn't show up on his paperwork, but that's how HPV works. They, he lied to them about wanting to marry them. He lied to them about having kids with them. Women slept with a man named Andrew Huberman who told them a bunch of lies in order to get them to sleep with him. So if you think that's a good person, if you think a good person lies and manipulates and sleeps with multiple women under false pretenses, you're telling on yourself. You're telling on yourself, you're telling on yourself, and your mom would be disappointed. You're telling on yourself, you're telling on yourself. That's what I mean. If you think that's what a good person does, cool. We disagree. Agree to disagree. But I think ultimately that's what this is about. If you think this is what, like, again, Maybe he's a great person when it comes to something else, but in regards to relationships, I think he's pretty bad at them. You know? HPV that leads to cancer for women. Sarah actually tested for the HPV strain that was quite connected to cancer actually, which kind of sucks. In 2021, she tested positive for high risk form of HPV, one of the variants linked to cervical cancer. I never tested positive, she says, and had been tested regularly for 10 years. A spokesperson for Huberman says he never tested positive for HPV. According to the CDC, there's currently no approved test for HPV in men. Duh. The way he's trying to like, oh, I don't have it. It's not on my testing paperwork. Yes, we know. But the, it only gets passed on by men. Men are the carriers. When she brought it up, she says he told her that you could contract HPV from many things. Andrew says, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about multi-truth telling and deception. He told evolutionary psychologist David Buss on November 2021 episode of Huberman Lab called How Humans Select and Keep Romantic Partners in Short and Long Term. They were talking about the regularities across cultures and made preferences. Could you tell us, Andrew says, about how men and women leverage deception versus truth telling and communicating some of the things around mate choice selection? Effective tactics for men, a leveled, a, a graveled voice, 68 year old bus says are often displayed cues to long term interest. Men tend to exaggerate depths of their feelings for women. Men tend to lie to you, convince you they want to have your babies, stay with you, love you no matter what. 
while they're fucking your best friend, while they're fucking married women with kids, while they're flying from here to there for work or for something else, while telling you every day, I absolutely adore you. I can't wait to have like a life with you. I love you so much. And if you think a good person does that, agree to disagree. If you think a moral person does that, agree to disagree. So my morals say this is not a good person. My dad would call this man a rat. My dad would say this is rat behavior. Men who are like this are rats. They're bad people. Or bad people subjective, right? Because of the construct. But you know what I mean. They're um, morally compromised people. Right? Yeah, it says trying not to go full man Sandrist right now. Bro, I really like Andrew Huberman. This is a disappointment. This is a disappointment. I am disappointed that another man that I was hoping was one of the good ones is just another one of the bad ones. That sucks. That fucking sucks. It's disappointing. Do men have no good role models? Are there no good role models for men? You know what I mean? Like, God, men really got it hard out here. Who are your role models? You know? <clears throat> Just sad, bro. Let's talk about infidelity and committed relationships, Andrew said, laughing. I'm guessing it does happen. He caught cheating twice and admitted to it both times. But <laughs> men have affairs. Men who have affairs tend to have affairs with larger number of affair partners, Bus said. And so which then by definition can't be long lasting? You can't. Have the long-term affairs with six different partners. Yeah, Andrew said. Unless he's, um, and here, Andrew looked into the distance, juggling multiple uh, phone accounts or something like that. Bus goes on. Right, right, right. And some men try to do that, but I think it would be very taxing. You know, I will say this, though. If Andrew's disciplined to juggle six women, maybe his shit works. Listen, like I said, I've liked Huberman. His morning routine stuff is dope. We've liked a lot of his work. My partner and I talk about his work a lot. We're kind of bummed. It's a disappointment. Nah, humans are going to human. But also, this is, in Brittany's mind, super immoral. And I would not recommend dating somebody like this. So I appreciate how productive he is. I appreciate all these things. I like his, his stuff that's good is good. But man, I hate people who can't walk the walk. What do I want to learn? It's like Justin Waller. It's like, I, I sympathize with you. I know your childhood was hard, but I don't care about some man who claims about being disciplined, but then can't keep it in his pants. If you're disciplined, be disciplined. And if you're not disciplined in all areas, at least admit that. At least Justin Waller admitted out loud. Yeah, I can't seem to keep it in my pants. But then he got offended at that woman on the Whatever podcast who tried to hold him accountable. You cannot be offended about being held accountable in terms of you claiming to be disciplined and you're not in one area. Just say, yeah, I'm not perfect. And just say, I'm a mess, but I'm working on it. Then I would be like, cool. But this idea that women should vouch for you or men should vouch for you or friends should vouch for you, I'm disappointed in Lex. Now, unless they come out and say, all these women are lying, all the text messages were fake, the recordings were fake, everything was fake, his relationship with Sarah was fake, which Andrew already said was real, you know, Mikey with the super chat says, so if men are the carriers of HPV, does that mean he slept with another gay man? Gay? No. No. Um, I'm not actually sure. I'm not a STI expert here. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I like the theory, though. I like that. That's pretty funny. Yeah, you can get HPV in different ways. And they're like more than likely he could have gotten it from another female partner who already had it from another male partner. The question is like who got the first HPV, <laughs> you know? How about being a decent person? Yeah, what? but the problem is like decent person is a bubble idea. It's like what is a decent person in your bubble? What's a decent person in yours? You know, like, okay, in my bubble where I grew up, like in my parents' bubble, um, like a decent person doesn't marry somebody who's like in their 20s when they're in their like 60s or 70s. You know, like I remember one of our relatives married a really young girl and we were all like, what are you doing? And like, yeah, it makes you look at them like, what are you doing? Like she's in her 20s and you're like literally in your 70s. Like, what are you doing? And they're just my mom calls it like gross. They're being such like men are pigs. 
Like men are pigs. You know what I mean? Like, what are you doing? It's like you, what are you doing? And you're probably just being lustful. Oh, uh, she divorced him eventually. Of course. She was looking for a green card. So. So I guess they deserved each other after all. The point is, is that people be out here thinking with their dicks. And I'm over it. I'm over people being like, I'm very disciplined, but I'm going to think with my dick. Maybe I'm, I grew up too Catholic, but uh, you're supposed to be in control of the dick. But also Catholics be known for being sex pests. So I'm bummed. Andrew Huberman had so much potential to be interesting and through and through turned out to just be another one of the bad men. The creep men, what's the word? Sex pest men. By 2022, Andrew was legitimately famous. Typical headlines read, I tried a Stanford professor's top productivity routine and Google CEO uses non-sleep deep rest to relax. Reese Witherspoon told the world that she was sure to get 10 minutes of sunlight in the morning and tagged Andrew. For sure. Super practice, 10 to 15 minutes of sunlight a day. Really good for you. When he was not in his own podcast, Andrew was on someone else's. He kept the place in Topanga, but he and Sarah began splitting rent in Berkeley. In June 2022, they fully combined lives. Sarah relocated her family to Malibu to be with him. According to Sarah, Andrew's rage intensified with cohabitation. He fixated on her decision to have children with other men. Another man, she had two children prior, which he obviously knew when they were dating. She says he told her that being with her was like, quote, bobbing, bobbing for apples in feces, end quote. Quote, the pattern of your 11 years while rooted in some cautious drives, he told her in December of 2021, creates a nearly impossible set of hurdles for us. You have to change. So he dated a woman who was a single mom. She was self-sufficient. All that was good. He knew she had kids. Once they started cohabitating, he started to break down and demoralize her and, un and treat her with un a lack of dignity because she was allegedly a woman who had improper pregnancies, right? A spokesperson for Huberman denies Sarah's accounts of their fights, denies the rage his, that his rage intensified with cohabitation, and denies that he fixated on Sarah's decision to have children with another man, and denies that he said being with her was like bobbing for apples and feces. A spokesperson said, Dr. Huberman is very much in control of his emotions, end quote. The first three rounds of IVF did not produce healthy embryos. In the spring of 2022, enraged again about her past, Andrew asked Sarah to explain in detail what he called her bad choices, most especially having her second child. She wrote it out and read it aloud to him. A spokesperson for Huberman denies this incident and says he does not regard her having a second child as a bad choice. I think it's important to recognize that we might have had a model for who someone is, says Dosit, or a model of how someone should conduct themselves. And if they do something that is out of sync with that model, it's like, well, they might not necessarily be that person. But maybe it's on us. Our model was just off. This is what I think is so interesting. Are we misunderstanding Huberman as the bad guy? Or are we misunderstanding him as the good guy? Are we misunderstanding people because we are charitable in our heads to them? Or are we misunderstanding people because we are uncharitable to them in our minds? And that's the question. I've had grown men tell me about their affairs. Tell me about how they've cheated. Tell me about how they've spread STIs. Tell me how they've done horrible things to women. And they sit here and think like, what do you mean you don't respect me anymore? And I'm like, what are you talking about? I knew a guy in my 20s who was like, I asked him, I was like, have you gotten tested? You've slept with over 200 women. Have you been tested? He goes, I don't need to get tested. I know if my dick has a cold. I was like, what is wrong with you? And he was like, what do you mean? He's like, we've been friends for so long. You've always respected my decisions. I was like, yeah, but not this one. Not the decision to sleep with hundreds of women who you've most likely contracted an STI from only to deny yourself an STI test because you're afraid of the results. He was like, yeah, well, like if I don't know, then I don't know. And I was like, great. But if you do find out you have an STI, that means you have to be careful about how you have sex. And he's like, exactly. And I was like, why would I respect this? That was basically the end of our friendship. Men are so shocked when they open their big fat mouths and tell me shit. And I'm like, and you wonder why I look at you differently? Hello? Hello? These men have the audacity, and it's not all men, it's this category of men. There's a type of category of men. 
who just think, well, I'm smart and I'm capable. And this person, by the way, was educated. He worked with governments, uh, government kids specifically. He was really interesting, had a, in, traveled the world, had a really interesting life, right? Charming. People liked him a lot. Hell, even I liked him. That's what I'm saying. I don't know what you expected of me. Even women. I've dealt with women where I'm like, hey, you got to stop uh, sleeping with that person. They're married. And they're like, oh, well, you know. And I was like, no. And they've broken up friendships with me because I was like, you got you to gotta stop doing that. You got to. You can't do that anymore. And they're like, um, yeah. So they chose their life of debauchery over friendship, which is fine. And I. That's good. But again, that's what I'm saying. What category of person are you, right? Hold on, let me bring this up. So what category of person are you is the question. When we're really having this question, that's what we're asking. Instead of, if you're, if you're afraid of casting moral judgment, don't worry about it. Let's just talk about categories. When we talk about morals and if I'm a good person or a bad person, this is going to be subjective to your bubble and your understanding of those words. They're not going to be objective. They're going to be very subjective. So when I look at my morals, the values I've written down, I've got a podcast on this. I really recommend it. When you write down your values and morals, they're the things that are your code of honor. So when temptation comes and presents itself as a fiery demon woman, you're able to say, no, I will choose a better path. And then you choose that better path. But a person without strong morals, a person with no discipline, will give in to temptation. It doesn't mean you're an awful, evil person. But if you do not have, hold yourself accountable, not other people. See, I don't need to hold Huberman accountable. I think it's a red flag he's not holding himself accountable. I think the fact that he's not holding himself accountable means he doesn't think what he did was bad. Which means like I look at him as a red flag now. Like, oh, he's dangerous. He's willing to put his partners at risk. He's willing to put himself at risk, right? Based off this article, based off of the way that it sounds, based off of the way that the story is being told. And by the way, you know that that um, the the swindler, twinder, twinder, swindler, you know, he's out of prison and living his best life. It didn't matter that he scammed all of his women out of thousands of dollars. He barely did any time. So again, outside of the law, your morals. And again, it doesn't mean you can't be friends with these people. It just means it's interesting that they don't hold themselves accountable. Gaming says, but, why, but you would be friends with people who can't hold themselves accountable? Um, Yeah. In some ways, for sure. Yeah, not all my friends are good at holding themselves accountable. But that's their journey. So in a philosophy sense, I've let go of attachment that I control other adults. What I control is myself. All I'm talking about is me right now. When I see Andrew, when I see my friends and they're making decisions where they're not holding themselves accountable, I then decide how to have a relationship with those people. Maybe I don't sleep with them because they might spread STIs. I'm married. But maybe I don't trust them with money. Maybe I don't tell, maybe I tell my friends not to date them. Maybe if a girl comes up to me and says, hey, I'd really like to date this person. I say, oh, no. Right? Marsh says, is this a very two way of thinking? Which part? Go into it more, right? So again, I'm not in control of my friends or the adults in my life. You're adults, right? I'm only in charge of how I interact with those adults, right? That's what I'm in charge of. Steve says, what does holding yourself at accountable after cheating look like? Well, it could look like a few things. It could look like first admitting fault, not blaming your partner, holding yourself accountable without blaming and saying, I take responsibility that I did this. I regret this decision. I'm moving on. I do not want to do this. And I want to be a better person. And so I will make strides to be that better person. Maybe I'll be celibate for a while. Maybe I'll make sure people know that, hey, I'm not, I'm not a person who's out of this bad habit yet. I need time. Holding yourself accountable is not hiding away that you did it, but also don't beat yourself up over it either, right? Mars says not being able to take accountability or introspect what's why it's wrong is a two way of thinking. Well, I would say it's a very human way of thinking and not all people are perfect in this regard, but twos are more than likely to double down on 
um, a less introspective reality. So y twos are technically always going to be more likely to not introspect to this point, but some twos do it all the time. Some twos are very introspective and absolutely can hold themselves accountable. So I don't think it's a twos way of thinking. I think it's a human. Human beings, regardless of twos or fives, could lack good introspection and end up convincing themselves that they don't need to hold themselves accountable because humans are going to human, whether you're twos or fives, right? So when we're talking about bad or immoral, we're talking about which shade of blue are we and making sure we're having the same kinds of conversations, Gaming says, if you can't trust someone in pers trust a person in one thing, can you trust them in others? I don't believe so. I think so. So I have learned in my own life, and this is something that, you know, is, is true for me. I have found that lots of people are really good in a lot of areas and usually pretty bad in others, whether they're good people or bad people. So, and these things are constructs. So um, even take it in a neutral sense. Like I'm really bad at math. I'm really good at philosophy. I'm really bad at math. So if you ask me to be good in math, that's kind of like fucking unfair, right? If you ask an addict to be, uh, well, that's a bad example, actually, because everyone's on a journey differently on a spectrum in that regard. People who cheat don't necessarily end up bad parents, but I will say it's probably a bad move as a parent to cheat because you're teaching by action that your child can use and abuse and treat people without dignity. But... If your child never knows you are a cheater, you could still be a great father or mother to that child. So I don't think being a bad partner means you're a bad parent or being a bad parent means you're a bad partner. I think sometimes those things normally overlap, but I don't think it's one-to-one -one always going to happen. Rashad says bad math gang in the building. Let's go. So I think I'm less likely to condemn somebody than... Other people, I will say I believe in redemption. I believe in people getting better. Some of my siblings are bad with money. It doesn't mean they're bad at being an uncle or an auntie. It doesn't mean they're bad at being sisters or brothers. It doesn't mean they're bad at being cousins. Some people are bad. I mean, we're all bad in something, you know? If somebody is having a problem with discipline, it might impact you. It, but it might not. That's why I say the boundaries start with you. If my sibling is having a hard time and they're really lacking in discipline and it's like ruining their life, I might help them out one time, two times with money. But by the third time, girl, you better learn what homelessness feels like, girl, because you just earned it. Not that you deserve it because nobody deserves anything, but you just earned it. You feel me? So have fun. You know, God, universe, aliens, they're about to teach you that lesson. But that has nothing to do with me, girl. Steve says, how do I hold myself accountable but not blaming any of the people that did the things they did to me? You, okay, so when you're, when you're holding yourself accountable, you're holding yourself accountable through a lens of your own morals and values. The question is, do your morals and values tell you that you're allowed to hurt people who have hurt you? Right? So blame is different than acknowledging a fact. It is a fact that my childhood is the reason I have borderline personality disorder. It is not my parents' fault, and I do not blame them anymore for it. One, it was not intentional. Two, they thought they were doing their best. Three, they never ever could have predicted that would have happened to me. Blaming them, faulting them for it, is so outside of reason and logic to me that the next step of healing is to be so logical about this, is to say, okay, no blaming, no pointing fingers. Instead, observing the facts. The facts are, if I wasn't in this bubble growing up, I wouldn't have had this problem mentally. But because I do, and it is the way it is, I can accept that that's just how my life goes. That's my anime story. Fine. The question is now, how do I get better? It starts with me tackling my problems internally. Now, of course, would it be lovely if my parents admitted that they contributed to this? Of course. But holding on to the attachment of them having that conversation is also not going to help me in the long run for my growth. They are responsible, but the only person who can hold them accountable is themselves. And if they choose not to hold themselves accountable for it, it is what it is. It is what it is. So I can only hold myself accountable and how I contribute to the world. I don't get to hurt my parents because they hurt me. 
I, my values say I can't stab a bitch because she stabbed me. I can only self-defend. I can only defend myself. So if a girl coming at me with a knife, I can stab her. But if a girl is running away from me, I'm not going to stab her. If she gets away and I hunt her down and I seek out revenge like I'm Jason Bourne, I'm in the wrong. I'm not allowed to kill people because they hurt me. Now, that's my values, my morals. Okay? You don't have to have those things. But if you've cheated, you've done something in a moment of time as the person that you are then, and you did it for a reason, find the real reason you did it. And if it's as simple as, I just didn't think it was that wrong. Ask yourself if you need it to be something wrong. You can't decide cheating is wrong because the world is shaming you to believe it. You have to decide if it's truly wrong for you. I don't know why you're here as well. I think we're animals on a planet. Are you going to hold a bear accountable for cheating? You going to tell the bear not to go around fucking other bears? No, because it's a bear doing what bears do. Humans are similar. But I think I could say that if you're a person, right? If you're a person who's willing to lie and gaslight and spread STIs and convince people that like, you're the only one I'm dating. I love you the most. We're going to have kids. And none of that is true. I think that says a lot about you. And I think it's fair for people to not want to be around you or associate with you. And if you think it's weird for people not to trust you after that, that's even weirder. How could you go around cheating, lying, and spreading STIs and being like, why don't people want to hang out with me anymore? Why don't women want to fuck me? And it's like, hmm. Yeah, I wonder why, bro. And don't worry. There are going to be plenty of women that will still want to be with Andrew Huberman. Now, this is all based off the article. Maybe Andrew Huberman has receipts and comes out and none of this is true. And then we're all going to have to learn from that as well. But we're really not talking about Andrew, are we? We're really talking about this category of person, right? Because we don't know Andrew. We don't know his real like feelings or who he is. This could be a huge fabricated conspiracy theory. But even his defenders are admitting he did those things. And they're saying, so what? And I'm saying that tells me you are telling on yourself. If even his defenders are like, yeah, he did it. So what? Okay, cool. Yeah, so what? Okay. Yeah. If you're that kind of person, you're that kind of person. I don't like those kinds of people. You know? So, okay. Steve said, thank you so much. That actually, um, it's like, uh, um, I have problems with words in my head. I can't say that word in my head. I can't hear it. Made me feel better. I feel like such a bad person for having so much hate for them, even if I did wrong too. It's normal, bro. It's normal. It's part of the growing process and the healing process. You'll make it through. Just like remind yourself that you're a human and you're going to do human things, but then remind yourself that you can do something different when you're ready, you know? He wants kids and he didn't think she was going to be successful. Who wanted kids? Who? Read the article. Didn't essay anyone. He's not married. What did he do wrong? Yeah, I don't know why you think there has to be essay. I don't know why you think he didn't do anything wrong. He was seeing multiple girls who did not know he was seeing multiple girls. He told them he they were all monogamous. He said he did not have other girlfriends. He said he had stalkers, right? He said these women were stalking me. They're not my girlfriends. He was telling all the women that he was only with them. They all had uncondomed, uh, the guys, they didn't wear condoms. They didn't use protection because they thought they were all monogamous and the women were getting tested and he got tested and they all thought they were fine, except he gave HPV to Sarah. And now I wonder if all the women have tested positive for HPV as well. So he lied to the women and had unprotected sex with them under false pretenses. That's not good. That's not good. That's not good. If you don't think there's anything wrong with that, you're telling on yourself. Right? That's crazy. But that's okay. Thank you for telling on yourself, right? Now we know not to sleep with you and not to trust you, right? Mm -mm -mm. Um, Jane uh, Zoe says, I've wondered that too. If a person has a tendency to cheat, why do they keep getting into monogamous relationships and end up cheating? If they're unable to be honest, the thrill. It is the thrill. They want to be valued. They want to be valued. They want to be told that they're important and a viable. That's the same reason why chronic cheaters on the internet are mad at me 
for viewing them as like not good to hang out with as a as a dating partner. The same reason chronic cheaters on the internet who've gaslit and lied to their partners are literally like, why would Brittany, why would Brittany say I'm not good? I'm not a good partner. Why would you say that? Because people are fucking crazy. You're all fucking crazy. You think it's absolutely okay to do these things and still be considered a good person to date. You're fucking insane. Go to therapy. Go to a church. Go to God. Do something. You're literally crazy if you think, again, I'm happy to say like, oh yeah, you're good at your job. I'm happy to say like, you're a nice enough person. But I, you're fucking crazy if you think my values and morals are going to say, oh, yes, this is definitely a good person to date, a person who will openly lie, cheat, and gaslight you and spread STIs or whatever else. Yeah, yeah, cool, 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 cool. Crazy. Absolutely crazy. And that's the part of the, like, I just, no. Okay, that's my line in the sand. No, I'm happy to know you. I am not happy to vouch for you. I'm not putting my reputation on the line so you can pretend you're a good person, like in terms of dating. In terms of dating. It's literally like these men who never see their kids, never participate in their lives, never pay child support, and they're like, I'm a great father. I'm like, man, we have different definitions of great fathers. Okay? No, ma'am. Mm -mm. No, ma'am. Absolutely not. But everybody loves to tell themselves a story. And the question is, what story are you telling yourself? What story about your own reputation are you telling yourself? See, I said this yesterday. When you lie to yourself, it becomes a no lie to the people you're telling the story to. When have you lied to yourself enough, when you've convinced yourself enough, when you say to other people, it doesn't feel like a lie. So you almost feel like you're telling the truth. And that's kind of the, the cognitive dissonance that you have to worry about. You do have to worry about the fact that if you're dealing with a person who lies to themselves, they're going to lie to you and not even feel like they're lying to you. And that's what's interesting. Anyways, this all comes down to us. I personally disappointed in Andrew Huberman. I'm disappointed in any man or woman who is willing to lie and trick people into relationships in order for them to sleep with them. I don't like fuckboys. I don't like, you know, people who use any means of lying in order to get somebody's attention, especially sexually. Not a fan of it. I don't think it's cute. I don't think it's upstanding, and I think it lacks dignity. NY Mag, whenever Sarah had suspicions about Andrew's interactions with another woman, he had a particular way of talking about the woman in question. She says, he said, the women were stalkers, alcoholics, and compulsive liars. He told her that one woman tore out her hair with chunks of flesh attached to it. He told her a story about a woman who fabricated a story about a dead baby to entrap him. A spokesperson for Huberman denies the account of the denigration of women on the dead baby story and says the hair story was taken out of context. Most of the time, Sarah believed him. The women probably were crazy. He was a celebrity. He had to be careful. It was in August of 2022 that Sarah noticed that she and Andrew could not go out without being thronged by people. On a camping trip in Washington State that same month, Sarah brought syringes and a cooler with ice packs. Every day of the trip, he injected the drugs meant to stimulate fertility in her stomach. into her stomach. This was round four. Later that month, Sarah says she grabbed Andrew's phone when he left it in the bathroom, checked his texts, and found conversations with someone we will call Eve. Some of them took place during the camping trip they had just taken. Quote, your feelings matter, he told Eve. On the day when he had injected his girlfriend with HG, HCG, quote, I'm actually very much a caretaker, end quote. And later, Quote, I'm back on grind tomorrow and would love to see you this weekend, end quote. Caught having an affair, Andrew was apologetic. Quote, the landscape has been incredibly hard, he said. I let the stress get to me and I defaulted to self-safety. I've also sat with the hardest of feelings. I hear your insights, he said, and I honestly appreciate them. Sarah noticed how courteous he was with Eve. So many offers, she pointed out, to, to process and work through things. Eve is an ethereally beautiful actress, the kind of woman from whom it is hard to look away. Where Sarah exudes a winsome, chaotic energy, Eve is intimidatingly 
collected. Eve saw Andrew on Rhea in 2020 and messaged him on Instagram. So Sarah and Andrew were together in 2018. Though Andrew makes claims that like, oh, apparently they weren't monogamous. But um, ma'am. Okay, so Rhea is that celebrity dating app. So Eve saw Andrew on Rhea in 2020 and messaged him on Instagram. They went for a swim in Venice and he complimented her form. You're definitely, he said, on the faster side of the distribution. She found him to be extraordinarily, uh, to be an extraordinarily, um, hold on. She found him to be an extraordinary listener and she liked the way he appeared to be interested in her internal life. He was busy all the time with his book and eventually the podcast, his dog and responsibilities at Stanford. Quote, I'm willing to do the repair, a work on this, he said, when she called him out for standing her up. He has a tendency to stand up people. He has like, I assume that's because he can't actually juggle all the bullshit he's going through. So my my assumption is even with his male friends, he kept flaking on them. It would make huge, huge, huge plans with them and then bail last minute, like day of or day before. So my theory is that he would make big plans with people, get their hopes up. I'm going to hang out with Andrew. And then right before the event came, he would realize he couldn't juggle it and he'd have to create an excuse where he canceled. Right. And then people put up with it because it's Andrew Huberman. He's famous. Like he wouldn't take the risk. You know, often I'll get feedback from people who say, like, why would famous people need to rape anybody? They're famous. They can have sex with whoever. It's about the power and control. It's not about the sex. Just like with incels. If you're so worried about being an incel, hire a sex worker and have sex with someone. But it's not about the sex. They want to be chosen. They want to be picked. They want to be desired. Why cheat? Or why get into a monogamous relationship if you're going to cheat? Well, because you can't cheat unless you're in a monogamous relationship. You can't cheat unless you're in a polyamorous closed relationship. You can't do things unless you are in a position to do them. So the idea, like, why would famous people need to rape anyone? Because it's not about the sex. It's, it's not about the sex, you know? And that's the thing that people are missing. Izzy says, why is he trying to get women pregnant when he's not committed to the relationship? He clearly doesn't take fatherhood seriously if he's starting off with lies. I'm kind of surprised they never got pregnant. So Sarah was his, quote, long-term live-in girlfriend. They were together six years. I don't know how long they were living together exactly. But um, they were trying. Apparently, some of the embryos weren't good. And so I'm assuming they were maybe, like, when they say viable embryos, I don't know if they mean like couldn't attach or if they mean like didn't want them because they weren't as healthy. You know what I mean? Dario says this man is power mad. He needs to be brought to justice. Well, the only, there is no like, I'm not sure what that means. What would bringing Andrew Huberman to justice mean? The only reason I'm covering it so we can ask ourselves what would we do if this was a pattern of somebody in our life or, you know, I have people in my life who have these patterns, by the way. I just warn people about them. But like people don't believe you and then it is what it is, right? Like what are you going to do? Or they do believe you and then great, right? <clears throat> Nibla says just wanting sex isn't completely out of the picture though. Only Andrew knows. Um... Um, nothing ever just is about sex. Nothing humans do is ever just about something. We don't just do things. There's always a why. And those sex isn't a good enough reason. It doesn't make sense. It's just not good enough. For this context, it doesn't make sense. And it probably isn't just about the sex. I just couldn't imagine that being true. <laughs> You know what I mean? There's so many ways he could have had just the sex. If it was just about sex, he wouldn't have been in a committed relationship. It's never just about sex. If all you want to do is have the freedom to have sex with whoever you want, then you would be a normal, logical human who just wouldn't have sex with somebody. Isn't it extra bad when he's a top neuroscientist? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how much of a top neuroscientist he is. I'm not sure what that means. Right? His dad was a physicist at Stanford, from my understanding. He's a neuroscientist who works with Stanford, as at Stanford. He went to Berkeley and UC Davis, I think. I think those were his schools. Um, very California boy. You know. Um, I'm not sure if that matters. 
You know what I mean? I don't know. Okay. Um. <clears throat> ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. Despite his endless excuses for not showing up, he seemed to Eve to be serious about deepening their relationship, which lasted on and off for two years. Eve had the impression that he was not seeing anyone else. She was willing to have unprotected sex, which is a theme with Andrew. He says, I'm not seeing anyone else. I'm only seeing you. So they have unprotected sex. Even when you're married, you know, you're going to have protected sex just from pregnancy alone. Maybe she was on birth control and maybe just condoms is what she means. But the fact that like he was continually having unprotected sex with multiple women and none of the women knew, like how is that in anyone's body? Like that's so unethical to me. In my opinion, so unethical. Just my opinion, so fucking unethical. As their relationship intensified over the years, he talked often about the family he would one day, he one day wanted. Quote, our children would be amazing, he said. She asked for book recommendations and he suggested jokingly Huberman, why we made babies. I'm at the stage in life where I truly want to build a family, he told her. That's a root sounding theme for me. How to mesh lives, he said in a voice memo. A fundamental question. One time he heard him say on Joe Rogan that he had a girlfriend. She texted him to ask about it and he responded immediately. He had a stalker, he said. And so his team had decided to invent a partner for the listening public. I later learned, Eve tells me, <laughs> that this was not true. So at this time... Sarah and him are in a relationship trying to get pregnant. And he's telling Eve in voice memos that he wants to have a family. Right? In September 2022, Eve noticed that Sarah was looking at her Instagram stories, not commenting or liking, just looking. Impulsively, Eve messaged her. Is there anything you'd like you'd rather ask me directly, she said. They set up a call. Fuck you, Andrew, she messaged him. Sarah moved out in August of 2023, but says she remained in a committed relationship with Huberman. Crazy. Women are so crazy. A spokesperson for Huberman says they were separated. At Thanksgiving that year, she noticed he was wiggly. Every time a cell phone came at the table, cell phone came at the out on the table, trying to avoid she suspected being photographed. She says she did not leave him until December. According to Sarah, the relationship ended as it had started, with a lie. He had been at her place for a couple of days and left for his place to prepare for a Zoom call. They planned to go to Christmas shopping the next day. Sarah showed up at his house and found him on the couch with another woman. She could see him through the window. She could see them through the window. She said, if you're going to be a cheater, she advised me later, do not live in a glass house. Girl. On January 11th, a woman we'll call Alex began liking all of Sarah's Instagram posts, seven of them in a minute. Sarah messaged her, I think you're friends with my ex, Andrew Huberman. Are you one of the women he cheated on me with? Alex is an intense, direct, highly educated woman who lives in New York. She was sleeping with Andrew, and she had no idea there had been a girlfriend. Fuck, she said. I think we should talk. Over the following weeks, Sarah and Alex never stopped texting. She helped me hold my boundary against him, says Sarah. Keep him blocked, she said. You need to let go of the idea of him. Instead of texting Andrew, Sarah texted Alex. Sometimes they just talked about their days and not about Andrew at all. Sarah still thought beautiful uh, Sarah still thought beautiful Eve, on the other hand, might be crazy. But they talked some more and brought her into the group chat. Soon there were others. There was Mary, a dreamy charismatic Texan he had been seeing for years. Her friends called Andrew breadcrumbs, given his tendency to disappear. There was a fifth woman in L.A., funny and fast-talking. Alex had been apprehensive. She felt foolish for believing Andrew's lies and worried that the other women would seem foolish, therefore compounding her shame. Foolish women were not, however, what she found. <sighs> Each of the five were assertive, successful, educated, and sharp-witted. There had been a type, and they were diverse. Uh, they were diverse expressions of that type. Quote, I can't believe how crazy I thought you were, Mary told Sarah. No one struck anyone else as a stalker. No one had made up a story about a dead baby or torn out hair with chunks in it. I haven't slept with anyone but him for six years, Sarah told the group. If it makes you feel any better, Alex joked, according to the CDC, they all have slept with one another. At least there's some humor. The woman compared timestamp screenshots of texts and assembled therein an extraordinary record of deception. 
Okay, I read this part already out loud to you guys, I think. Mary, okay, he was sleeping in the phone died. Okay, I already read this part to you. Um, okay. What do we think about that? What do you guys think? You know what I mean? Why do women stay in relationships with guys like this? They want to save them. I think, I think that's why they target women like this. In order to get a woman to stay with you, even though you've cheated on her, to get a woman to stay with you, especially one who's successful, um, you've got, you've got to show potential and you've got to be somewhat of an interesting person. Something about you makes you, makes them want to see you be a better person. Huberman's attractive. Huberman is educated. Huberman works at Stanford. Huberman has a lot about him. That's interesting, right? And there's a hope that these women are successful, are smart, are interesting, and they're hoping that they'll have a partner they feel is an equal to them. Except Andrew's a piece of shit. Because men who do this are rats. They're just rats, bro. And they hope to save men like this. The fact that Lex came out and supported him is interesting. I guess Lex is assuming none of this is true. Or maybe he thinks it is true. You know? It's kind of interesting. Now, this is one of the problems I see. I saw this actually with Shelby and Wilbur in the YouTube sphere, in the Twitter sp Twitch sphere, right? Where you can have an abusive partner who is not like jail worthy. I don't know if we need to send Huberman to jail because I don't really believe in prisons. But he's obviously got problems and he's obviously not to be trusted. And he's obviously not somebody who I would recommend you to trust, right? Same with Wilbur. Like, I don't think Wilbur needs to go to prison. I think he needs to go to a therapist. He's obviously abusive, but abuse is a spectrum. Not all people are abusive in the same ways. Not all people are even cognizant of their abusive tendencies, as we watched on Dr. Kirkonda yesterday. So we don't even know, you know, what the actual answer would be, like what actually helps people. All we have to ask ourselves is, is Andrew Huberman willing to admit he needs help in the first place? And it's probably no. And then the question is, do we as a society need to pull up, put up billboards to warn people not to deal with people like this? You know what I mean? That's the question. Izzy says, when does he have time to reach a, out uh, reach as a professor when he's podcasting and juggling women well allegedly he lives six hours from stanford so some of the alleged colleagues they talk to were also wondering why he always says he's in the lab when he's like not always in the lab but stanford did report to the news um the news article to ny mag that his lab was open and operational and i think is currently being moved if i remember what i read but again the question is what do you do when you have somebody like this in your community. When I tell you I know things about people and I never know if I should tell people, it's usually stuff like this. No one's hitting somebody. Nobody's raping anybody. But man, they're being fucked up. Do I tell people? Should I come out and say like, hey, I heard this? What if the victims tell me not to say something? These women don't mind if their story is told because they're like, hey, people should know this about him. And I agree. So I come from a world where I agree with this. I like that Dave Ramsey fired the guy who cheated on his wife. But I also understand living in a world where maybe that's not the best solution. I don't want to live in a black and white world either. Right? Gaming says you forgot women who openly pursue serial killers. Right, but these aren't these women, right? These women aren't going to openly pursue a serial killer. So again, it's like when do you come out and say things to people, right, to protect your community or protect others? Usually my rule of thumb is directly. So if someone DMs me personally and says, hey, I'm seeing this guy. I heard you knew him. Do you know anything about him? I'd be like, oh, yeah, bro. Nah. And I would tell them like the list of things I know about them. I'd be like, I wouldn't date them if I was you. But I wouldn't necessarily volunteer that information without a direct victim who's possibly going to be hurt. Does that make sense? So I usually wait until somebody reaches out and says like, hey, I'm dating this person. Do you know anything about them? It's like, yep. Yep, I do. I would not, I wouldn't let my sister, I would tell my sister not to date them. So I would tell you not to date them. You feel me? <sighs> Ooh. 
While Huberman was criticized for having too few women guests on his podcast, in January 2023, Sarah Godfrey, Dr. Sarah Godfrey, argues that patriarchal messaging and white supremacy contribute to the deterioration of women's health. I'm skipping, 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 skipping. In private, he could sometimes seem less concerned about patriarchy. Multiple women recall him saying he preferred the kind of relationship in which a woman was monogamous, but the man was not. Our boy is red-pilled, bro. I never saw Andrew Huberman as a red pill, bro, bro. I never saw him that way. I... And I think this is where I say is the responsibility on us as viewers. I never thought of him as a red pill dude. I always thought of him as like a nice dad guy, like a guy who was nice. He's not nice. Like I never thought of Andrew Huberman this way. I have to recontextualize what category I put him in. I put him in the wrong category. I wasn't thinking he was Myron. I was thinking he was just like nice nice and considerate and thoughtful and all these other things he told me says mary that what he wanted was a woman who was submissive who he could slap in the ass in public and who would be crawling on the floor for him when he got home a spokesperson for huberman denies this the women continued to compare notes he had his little ways of checking in good morning beautiful there's a particular way he would respond to a sexy picture. Mmm, hi there. <laughs> a spokesperson for Huberman insisted that he had not been monogamous with Sarah until the late 2021. But a recorded conversation he had with Alex suggested that in May of that year, he had led Sarah to believe otherwise. Quote, well, she was under the impression that we were exclusive at the time, he said. Women are not dumb like that, dude, Alex responded. She was under that impression... Then you were giving her that impression. Andrew agreed. That's what I meant. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to put it on her. The kind of women to whom Andrew Huberman was attracted. The kind of women who were attracted to him. These were women who paid attention to what went into their bodies. Women who made avoiding toxicity a central focus of their lives. They researched non-hormonal disrupt disrupting products, avoided sugar, ate organic. They were disgusted by the knowledge that they had had sex with someone who had untold number of partners all of them wondered how many others there were when sarah found andrew with the other woman there had been a black pickup truck in the driveway and she had taken a picture the women traced the plates but they had hit a dead end and never found her tell us about the dark triad he says to bus in november on the trip in which he slept with sarah the dark triad consists of three personality characteristics said bus so narcissism machiavellianism and psychopathy such people feign corporation, but then cheat on subsequent moves. They view other people as pawns to be manipulated for their own instrumental gains. Those who are high on dark triad traits, he said, tend to be good at the art of seduction. The vast majority of them were men. Andrew told one of the women that he wasn't a sex addict. He was a love addict. Addiction, Huberman says, is a progressing narrowing of things that bring you joy. I'm going to say that again. Huberman says, addiction is a progressing narrowing of things that bring you joy. So obviously, I think joy brings you furthest from evil. Evil being this mythical construct of like this magical demonic evil. Huberman has been quoted as even denying himself joy. Because it's more disciplined. Because his joy is materialistic. My joy is spiritual. So when Brittany talks about joy, I'm talking about an alignment with you and your consciousness. And he's talking about fucking. Okay. <laughs> the whole idea of being a love addict, always, always, always a red flag. Always a red flag. Always, 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 always a red flag. It's not about the sex, baby. It's about the love. I had to cheat on her. This other woman needed me. I needed to save her. That's, I needed to cheat. I needed to, this woman was waiting for me to save. She was young and fragile. I needed to help. He's also been in therapy for years. According to his partners, they kind of, he kind of laughed off therapy. 
I don't know if he's been in therapy for years. He's been to therapy. He's bragged about therapy. Lots of narcissists use therapy to learn how to manipulate people. We saw this with Clay in Love is Blind. I swear he went to therapy to learn how to manipulate people, which is, by the way, what bad people do. You can go to therapy and get nothing out of it because you want your therapist to say, yes, girl, you. You can go to therapy and get nothing out of it because you're just learning how to use uh, and learn learn and use terminology to manipulate other people. Going to therapy doesn't make you a good person if you're not using it for good things. You can use therapy for bad things. Medical doctors aren't good people because they're doctors. I know we were all, well, I was taught in my bubble, good people become doctors. No. Bad people also become doctors. Ryan Reynolds and um, his wife, why am I blanking on her name? Oh my God, why am I blinking? Guys, what's her name? Oh my God, I'm blinking on her name. They have a, 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 um, a charity for protecting children from predators. And she said babies with the umbilical cord still attached are molested by their doctors. So. Okay. And obviously, if he's addicted to anything, he should get help for that, obviously. We're not shaming. Blake Lively, thank you. We're not shaming addic people who are addicts. We are rolling our eyes at people who make an excuse for their bad behavior. Right? If he's an addict, he should get help. Right? If he's an addict, he should definitely get help. But I don't see him on his podcast admitting to addiction, to sleeping with multiple women and having problems. Hopefully he'll, um, hopefully he'll, um, do that soon. You know? That's why I'm confused about Lex's text message. Like Lex's, like, tweet, sorry, X post, saying, like, Huberman's a good person. This is a hit piece. You know? Okay. Okay. Da -da -da -da. Okay. So in August of 2021, the same month Sarah first learned of Andrew's cheating, he released an episode with Anna Lempeck, chief of the Stanford Addiction Medicine Dual Diagnoses Clinic. Lembeck, the author of the book Dopamine Nation, gave a clear explanation of dopamine. Uh oh, guys, what is this big word? I don't know how to say this big word. Oh my goodness. Roots of addiction. She says, What happens right after I do something that is really pleasurable, she says, and releases a lot of dopamine is again, my brain is going to immediately compensate by down, -reg down regulating my own dopamine receptors. And that's the come down or the hangover of that uh, after effect. The moment of wanting to do it, that moment of wanting to do it more. Someone who waits for that feeling to pass, she explained, will re-regulate, go back to the baseline. If I keep indulging again and again and again, she said, ultimately, I have so much on the pain side that I've, uh, I've essentially reset my brain to what we call anhedonic or lacking in joy type of state, which is dopamine deficit state. Oh my God, this is hard for me to read. My dyslexia is so bad. This is a state in which nothing is enjoyable. Everything sort of pales in comparison to this one drug that I want to keep doing. Just for the record, Andrew said, smiling, Dr. Limbeck has diagnosed me with outside the clinic in a playful way of being work addicted. You're probably right. Limbeck laughed. You just happen to be addicted, she said gently, to something that is really socially rewarding. Or rewarded, sorry, rewarded. Okay. What he failed to understand, he said, was people who ruin their lives with their disease. Quote, I think, I'd like to think I have the compassion, he said, but I don't have the empathy for taking a really good situation and what from the outside looks to be like throwing it in the trash. At least three ex-girlfriends remain friendly with Huberman. He goes deep very quick, says Keegan Emmett, who dated Andrew from 2010 to 2017. And continues to admire him. Notice that he has long-term relationships with people. He just tends to overlap them and lie to them about that. Okay. He has incredible emotional capacity. A high school girlfriend says both she and he were troubled during their time together. That he was complimented and, I'm sorry, that he was com complicated and jealous, but a good person whom she parted on with good terms. He really wants to get involved emotionally, but then can't quite follow through. 
says someone he dated on and off between 2006 and 2010. But yeah, I don't think it's she hesitates. I think he has a, I think he has such a good heart. So he goes from relationship to relationship to relationship. Notice that too, right? 2006 to 2018, four years. High school, then that. And then 2010 to 2017, seven years. And then 2017, he breaks up. 2018, he's dating Sarah. And then five other women. Interesting. I think it's interesting that he's in a lot. Probably, I'm assuming, getting that supply. I'm assuming he's getting that supply. That's what I'm assuming. Andrew grew up in Palo Alto, just before the dawn of the internet, a lost city. He gives some version of his origin story, The Rich Roll Podcast. He repeats it for Tim Ferriss and Peter Atia. Atia. He tells Time Magazine and Stanford Magazine, quote, take the list of all the things a parent shouldn't do in a divorce. He recently told Christian Bell, Hunter Cameron Haynes, they did them all. You had, says Wendy Zuckerman, in her bright Aussie accent, a wayward childhood. I think it's very easy for people listening to folks with their bi with bios like yours, says Tim Ferriss, to sort of assume a certain trajectory, right? To assume that it always has to come easy. His father and mother agree that our divorce was incredibly hard for Andrew, though they do not agree with some of his character characterization of his past. Few parents want to be accused of pure neglect. His dad was a physicist for... Uh, Stanford and his mom was a author of a child's book okay Chrissy says how could he be so disciplined yet so reckless and have five secret girlfriends you're deaf not disciplined bro he's a mess bro he's a mess someone show Andrew romance novels please literally bro Andrew attended Gunn a high performing high pressure high school classmates describe him as always with a skateboard they remember him as a pleasant sweet and not particularly academic and not particularly academic. He would say one former, uh, he would say one former classmate, drop in on the half pipe <laughs> where he was encouraging to other skaters. I mean, he was cool. He was the cool kid or he was a cool individual kid, says another classmate. There was one year he like bleached his hair and everyone was like, oh, that guy's cool. It was a wealthy place, the kind of settling no, sorry, my reading, I'm getting tired. It was a wealthy place, the kind of setting where the word au pair comes up frequently and Andrew did not stand out to his classmates as an out of control or unpredictable person. I'm adding, sorry, I added it in person. They didn't say that. Sorry, it's just I read bad. They do never call him getting into street fights as Andrew claims he did. He says, um, he was, says Andrew's father, a little bit troubled, yes, but that. But it was not something super serious. So I don't know if you guys know this. Is Andrew tells stories of growing up in fights, being sent to a detention center for a month, having a really messy divorce. This is a guy who grew up in a nice rich neighborhood, went to Stanford University, Berkeley, and UC uh, Davis. Okay. It's like very interesting. You know what I mean? Um, his parents don't like the way he tells his stories because they feel like it wasn't that bad, but most parents think that. So maybe it was that bad, right? A lot of parents don't like the way that their kids tell their stories. So either Andrew's lying or his parents are lying. It's not that abnormal for parents to downplay the negativity, right? Okay, let's see. Andy says Andrew gets into life stuff and doesn't just stick to his field. So I think it's fair to talk about his personal life. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think public figures, this is just the reality of their life. Like, I hate to say it, but also they do. That's the problem with public, public figures is they'll reference their own life or they'll reference things about their life to sort of prove that their work is good so people can look up to them. There's so many people, so many people that aren't in their children's lives who will admit openly to not prioritizing their children over work or other things or relationships and then use their kid as like, oh, but I'm a father, I'm a mother, I have a child, you know, I'm a parent, but like you're not even an active parent. So it's like people want to have their cake and eat it too. They want to be the disciplined guy 
who can't seem to control his dick. They want to be considered a good parent without ever having to tuck their kids into bed. They want to be a good partner without, you know what I mean? Like everybody wants their cake and eat it too. You know? Okay. So, okay, his father says he was a little troubled, yes, but it was not something super serious. What does seem certain is that in his adolescence, Andrew became a regular consumer of talk therapy. In therapy, one learns to tell stories about one's experiences. A story one could tell is, I overcame immense odds to be where I am. Another is, the son of a Stanford professor born at Stanford Hospital grows up to be a Stanford professor. This is interesting, right? Is Andrew a difficult man who had a difficult life and overcame adversity to become successful? Or is he born in a rich neighborhood to rich parents of good standing and ended up working at the same college his dad worked at? I have never, says Emmett, a me met a man more interested in personal growth. Andrew's relationship to therapy remains intriguing. We were at dinner once, says Eve. And he told me something personal. I suggested he talk to a therapist. He laughed it off like he wasn't ever going, like it ever, it, like it, ne oh my God. Sorry, guys. He laughed it off like that wasn't ever going to happen. So I asked him if he'd lied to his therapist. He told me he did it all the time. A spokesperson for Huberman denies this. I'll be real. I've dated people who have admitted they've like lied to people and lied to their therapist because they were too embarrassed to tell people things. I mean, I did lie to my first therapist when she asked me if I'd ever been raped and I said no, but I didn't trick my therapist. I just wasn't ready to talk about it. My second therapist, I fully went totally honest with her. I was like, I've been raped. All these things have happened. I'm ready to talk about it. I want to get better. Is Andrew saying he lied to his therapist in the way that I'm saying? Sometimes you're not ready to talk about things. Or did he lie to his therapist as a way to manipulate her which I, or him, which I've seen many times with people with NPD and other other issues where they don't want to be honest with even the therapist. I even dated a guy. We went to couples therapy once and he lied about something right to the therapist's face. And I was like, I have the text messages. And then I showed the text messages and he was like, oh, well, that's not what I meant. And I was like, but that's what the message said. And so people will lie. Like people do lie about things. So it's like, what do you think the difference is? Are we reading Andrew as a villain who's lying in bad faith? Or is he lying because he's not ready to talk about something? So we've, you know, everyone's lied. The question is, why are you lying? So I know that I know I tend, I don't lie about other people. That's like a very important thing. That's like something I'm prideful about is I don't lie about other people. I've lied about myself. Like I will lie and say I've never been raped. That's about me. But I would never lie and say someone raped me who didn't. Like, I do not lie about other people. It's a very important part of who I am as a person, right? I don't know if Andrew isn't willing to lie about other people since he seems to be willing to lie about the women being stalkers. Right? Cognitive dissonance says, I mean, you don't have to walk the walk in order to tell people the right thing to do, though. I mean, I can say you shouldn't finish college without finishing college. I think it depends on the situation. Do you, I think it's true that some people learn that way. Not all people do. I think you have to walk the walk. I don't want to listen to a fat person tell me how to get into shape. I don't. I don't want to listen to a, a currently addicted person living on the streets telling me how to get sober. I don't give a fuck. I want to hear it from somebody who did it. Because the last person I'm going to believe is somebody who can't do it themselves. I don't want to hear a serial cheater like tell me not to cheat. I already know not to cheat, dick. I'm asking you how to stop. At that point, we don't want to be told, like, you can't tell people, like, don't do this, this thing that I do all the time. You have to tell people after you've stopped doing it why you should stop doing it. You're not making a good enough argument while you're in it to prove you should stop doing it. It's why people end up mimicking people because you do make it look fun. You're obviously doing it, so it must be pretty good. Now it looks like you're gatekeeping it. Some people learn that way. Some people don't. I don't seem to learn that way. I want to talk to people who have done things. I'm fascinated by those people, which is why I hate that people beef up their credentials and they pretend they've done something they haven't done. Now, if you learn from people saying, hey, don't do this thing, cool, great, right? 
If you learn that way, cool. I don't care. I don't want to hear it out of your mouth. I don't want to hear a person that doesn't pay child support talk about being a good father. I don't want to hear from somebody who abandoned their children in a trash can how to be a good mother. I don't want to hear it from you. Because it's not a matter of them saying don't do it. It's also the other side of why not. If somebody is chronically cheating and they're like, you shouldn't cheat, why not? Well, it hurts people's feelings, so why are you doing it? And then they still want to be considered a good part of society. They want to be like, there's so many things that go into this is why it doesn't work for all brains, right? So everyone's brains work differently. My brain does not give a fuck. I don't want to hear it from you. The last thing I want to be is lectured by somebody who can't even walk the walk. Shut the fuck up. But you know, if you learn that way, great. Okay. Um, Discourse says, Brittany, for years giving relationship and marriage advice as a single person. Ah, 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 ah. Okay. Thank you for trying to keep me humble. But remember, I gave advice on how to realize you're in a toxic relationship because I was in one. So again, walking the walk is different, right? I think you can give advice. I think people who don't have kids can give really good advice about raising children if you've worked in child care. I really do. I don't think you have to have kids to know what it's like to be a parent because a lot of us were parentified as kids. A lot of us worked in child care. A lot of us had to raise your babies because you weren't raising them. It didn't matter that I didn't give birth to babies. I've raised babies. So it's like, okay, um... But with with Andrew, I'm not sure this is enough for people to stop listening to him on science stuff, but it might be enough for you to stop listening to him because of the ick. You know what I mean? Izzy says, do we know if any of Huberman's friends know he was about the cheating? I've known guys who cheat and they will tell their friends at times. I'm not sure, but Lex Friedman came out in defense of Andrew Huberman and he said the article was a hit piece. So it sounds like Lex either believes him or doesn't think it's a big deal that he cheated. You know, <clears throat> I'm not sure, you know, so yeah, I don't know. Now, if you stay with a cheater, I do think at that point you are consenting to being cheated on in the future or understanding that like just because he cheated yesterday doesn't mean he's going to like stop cheating tomorrow. It's going to take some time. So I think like I do recommend to people to leave people who cheat on them. But at the same time, I know lots of people who go to marriage counseling and make it work and stay together for another 40 years. And I think a lot of people hope that that's going to be their story. Um, I I consider cheating abuse. So if you want to stay in an abusive relationship in hopes that it will get better, you're allowed to do that. But also remember that them staying under false pretenses is still bad. So Andrew saying, I've cheated. You're right. I was wrong. I'll get better. That's still him lying to her. And if you think she's foolish for being with somebody and giving him a chance, then we agree Andrew's a piece of shit. That still makes Andrew the bad person in the story, right? Because Andrew's the one who cheated and then promised not to do it again. He's the child who like is saying, oh, I'm sorry I got caught cheating. I won't do it again and cheats anyways. And then it's up to the adults in the room to understand how to hold the child accountable because obviously he can't hold himself accountable or hold themselves accountable, right? Depending on who's where what perspective we're coming from by not interacting with him which eventually sarah does right eventually sarah does leave him officially and it's done but you know for a fact women are shamed for leaving relationships especially older women and this was an older relationship and women are shamed for leaving relationships and not trying hard enough oh women give up on their men so easy why don't women ever like support men and since he was more traditional he probably did shame her for wanting to leave and also wasn't honest with how he wanted to have multiple partners enough to negotiate that beforehand. So he had to cheat his way into those relationships. Yeah. Amber says, I'm still behind, but Britt thought Huberman was a dad type. He wants to be a dad. He lied. I believed him. I believed him when he said he wanted to be a family man. I believed him. See, I would have fallen for his bullshit because I thought he wanted to be a family man. Why would I doubt him? Liars be lying, bro. Okay. People high on psychopath, uh, psychopathy are good at deception. Psychopathy? Psychopa psych psychopathy. Thank you. People who are high on psychopathy are good at deceptions as bus. I don't know if they're good at self-deception. That's interesting to me. 
With repeated listening to the podcast, one discerns a man undergoing in public an effort to understand himself. There are hours of talking about addiction, trauma, dopamine, and fear. Narcissism comes up constantly. Shout out to the reminder that so many therapists on YouTube dedicate their life to dismantling narcissists. So many of the therapists on YouTube whose content are all about how narcissists are evil are and have come out as NPD. And I think that's interesting. I think that's interesting. One can see attempts to understand and also places where those attempts swerve into self-indulgence. On a recent episode with Stanford-trained psychiatrist Paul Conti, Andrew and Conti were describing the psychological phenomenon of aggressive drive. Andrew had an example to share. He once canceled an appointment with a Stanford colleague. There was no response. Eventually, he received a reply that said, in Andrew's telling, quote, well, it's clear that you don't want to pursue this collaboration, end quote. Andrew was, he said to Conti, shocked. I remember feeling like I was pretty aggressive, Andrew told Conti. It stands out to me as a pretty salient example of aggression. So to me, said Huberman, that seems like an example of somebody who has a, well, strong, aggressive drive, and when disappointed, you know, lashes back or is passive. There's some ways in which that person doesn't feel good enough no matter what this person has achieved. So then there's a sense of a need and the right to over control. Sure, says Huberman. And now we're going to work together, right? So I'm, exer I'm exerting significant control, control over you, right? And it may be that he's not aware of it. In this case, said Andrew, it was a she. The woman explained Conti based in... Wait, this woman, explained Conti, based entirely on Andrew's description of two emails, had allowed her unhealthy, excessive aggression to be eclipsing the generational generative drive. She requires that Andrew, quote, bow down before her in the service of ego because she did not feel good about herself. So Andrew, having a pattern of flakiness from male friends to girls he's dated to people in his life, he's known as a flake. Even the girls he was dating, they're partners, parent or not friends and parents, sorry, thought of Andrew as a flake, right? They even had nicknames for him because he was such a flake. He flakes on a colleague. The colleague does passively aggressively respond. She should have just ignored him and moved on. But it's frustrating when a guy who has a pattern of being like, I want to do this with you. I can't wait. Oh my gosh. And they never get back to you with no explanation. Like me, some of y'all know, I have a hard time getting back to people. So I tell you, just bother me in the DMs. Just ding me because I just forget. Once I work, look away from an email, I forget it exists. I mean, I forget my husband exists. I will literally be so focused in my work and then I'll be like, oh, I'm married. And then I'm like, I'm telling you I have ADHD. I'm telling you. Like I will like, oh, I will like remember that he exists and I'm married and I love him, you know? So I... I think with Huberman, it's more or less showing a pattern of disregard for people's time and effort. He was going to go on a camping trip with a male colleague, was so excited to do it, so stoked, canceled on him. Same day. The man thought it was very strange. Huberman came up with all these excuses. I just think it's not reasonable. It's not what a reasonable person does. It's crazy. It's just like crazy people thinks, you know? I'm not saying he's a bad person through and through. I'm just saying like, this is a problem. And if you don't think it's a problem, you're the problem, you know? Um, okay. Um, okay. I'm going to skip a bit because it's boring. Uh, you guys can pay the dollar if you want to read the whole article. I want to get to... Okay. Okay, um, there is an argument to be made that it does not matter how helpful a podcaster conducts himself outside of the studio. A man unable to constrain his urges may still preach uh, dopamine, guys, I don't want to say that word, control to others. Morning sun remains sultry. The psychological sigh, no, physiological sigh, Employed by this writer many times in the writing of this essay continues to affect calm. The large and growing distance between Andrew Huberman and the man he continues to be may not even matter to those who buy questionable products he has recommended and from which he will be materially benefited. 
or listeners who imagined a man in a white coat at work at Palo Alto. I just want to say I don't much care that he's selling substances that might not work because lots of people do that and lots of people, I mean, you just do what you're going to do. Dopamine Eric. Dopamine Eric. Am I saying it? Dopamine Eric. It's so hard for me to say words. Thank you. The people who uh, definitively find the space between fantasy and reality to be prob- to be a problem are women who fell for a podcaster who profess deep, sustained concern for their personal growth and who, in his skyrocketing influence, continue to project an image of earnest self-discovery. It is here in the false belief of the two minds and synchronicity and explora- exploration that deception leads to harm. They fear it will lead to more. There's so much pain, says Sarah, her voice breaking. Feeling we had made mistakes, we hadn't been enough. We hadn't been communicating. By making these other women into the other, I hadn't really given space for their hurt and let it sink in with me that it is so similar to my own hurt. Three of the women on the group text met up in New York in February and the group has only gotten closer or grown closer. On any given day, one of the five can go into an appointment and come back to 100 texts. Someone shared a Reddit thread in which a commenter claimed Huberman had a stable full of hoes, quote. Another responded, I think he, I hope he thinks of us more like Care Bears, at which point they sign themselves Care Bear names. Wow. We're all just kids, no matter what. Him, you're the only girl I ever let come into my apartment, read a meme someone shared under it was a yellow lab looking extremely skeptical. They regularly use Andrew's usual response and explicit photos mm, to comment on on pictures of another's pets. They are holding space for other women who might join. This group has radicalized me, Sarah tells me. There has been so much processing. They're planning weekend uh, uh planning a weekend together this summer. I could it could be nope, stop. It could have been sad or bitter, says Eve. We didn't jump in as besties, but real friendships have been built. It has been, in a strange and unlikely way, quite a beautiful experience. End of article. Sorry, guys. My reading is very difficult. Thank you for sitting through that. I didn't read it all. There were sections above that you might find interesting as well, like the male friend who wanted to go on a camping trip with him, and then he canceled day of, and made they went on small hikes instead, and it was very interesting, and Huberman's always over promising. So if you guys want to check that out, I thought it was really good. Anyway, Mag, it's worth the dollar to get in to read the article. I thought it was really interesting. It's really long. But those were the parts that I thought were most interesting because, look, I think there is a pattern of behavior. I think we all know people who are like this. I know people who are like this. And they're not my favorite people. I think they're frustrating to deal with. I think they treat people unfairly. I think they're focused on their own ego. I think they're willing to hurt whoever it takes to get whatever they need. The ends justify the means. And I would warn people to like be cautious around them. I'm not saying he's an evil person. I'm not saying he's the worst person who's ever existed. But he is a consent violator. He does lie. He does gaslight. And unless he has evidence that the text messages and voice recordings weren't real, I'm not sure what he expects people to believe. You know what I mean? So... You know, I don't know if he should get fired from his job. I'm not sure that's necessary. I think Stanford can decide if they want him representing them as a brand. And that's one thing, right? Because this is about brands as well. You know, if a brand doesn't want you representing them, that's fair. I think it is fair a little bit. But also we can talk about discrimination um, laws, whether or not cheaters can be discriminated against, whether that's good for communities, whether cheaters should go unpunished. I mean, people tried to use that against Trump during his campaign. Bill Clinton left the White House. I mean, not just for the cheating, obviously. He had oral sex with an intern, which is incredibly inappropriate, right? So it's up to you how you feel about Humorman. It's a disappointment. Another man, horrible role model. I wouldn't say he's a good role model. Um, I'm not sure how much of his story is real now, given quotes from his parents and other people or his father. I'm not sure what's real. You know, they didn't even know that that one of the parts of the article talked about this like um, basically home for troubled teens. He says he'd spent a month at and people killed themselves there. Couldn't be corroborated. No evidence of that. He couldn't even remember the name of the facility he had to go to. It's just a story he tells on podcasts. Who knows what's real? All I know 
If it looks like shit and smells like shit, it's probably shit. And Andrew Huberman, as much as I said he looked like a daddy before, now he look suspicious. So yeah, I'm not a fan of Huberman. I've gotten the ick for him. I can't probably watch him again in the future. I maybe watch him depending on his guests, but yeah. Just another podcast bro using clout to get pussy. So lame. Men are so lame sometimes. This group of men, this category of men, they're just so lame. So lame, bro. Why can't everyone just be open and proud sluts without cheating or spreading STIs? Oh, I'm, I'm just serious. Discord says I'm behind, but I wonder why women don't want to fuck with me. Has me dead, bro. Or I wonder why only toxic women want to fuck with me. Bro, because you're toxic. You know? Hayda says, if nothing else, Huberman is a confirmed liar. And that's the irony is like, I think that's enough for me. I don't want to deal with chronic liars. I don't mind that people lie, but the kind of lying is what matters to me. The why you lie, what position are you in? Are you willing to admit the lie? Talk about the lie. You know what? I mean? There's so much. You know what I mean? There's like so much that goes into the nuance of lying and why people do it. But the fact that he's this kind of liar, this category of liar, makes me not trust him. How do you get pussy then? You connect with people, bro, and you have consensual sex. All bubbles are different. All people get pussy different ways. I ask for it. Would you like to have sex with me? And the girl goes, yeah, I'm into you. And then we have sex. For other people, they have to use like clout and status and shit. But that's weird. I don't know who you're fucking. Not everybody, it just, everyone's fucking different people. It depends on who you're trying to fuck. People have different requirements, you know? It just depends on who you're trying to get with. Just depends on who you're trying to get with. Just depends on who you're trying to get with. I do think if you find yourself being toxic and abusive, you should consider therapy and philosophy, Right? And I think you should consider why you're willing to hurt people or act a certain way and what that means. Because I don't think people are doing that part. They're not saying, why do I do this? Why don't I do the laundry? Why do I make my partner wait two hours while I get ready? Why do I tend to pick fights with my partners? Why am I cheating on my girlfriends? Like, why is he doing it? I mean, that's a great question. But I think for some people, the answer is so malicious, they don't want to face themselves. Or the answer is so pathetic, they don't want to face themselves. Isn't it interesting how especially men will be like, I'm smart, I'm intelligent, I'm high IQ. I can't seem to keep my dick from fucking crazy. Why? And they don't ever sit to ask themselves, why are you doing this though? Or they're not willing to say out loud, honestly, I'm going to do it and I'm going to keep doing it and I like doing it. And they don't even know why they like doing it. I would still ask myself why. Don't just ask yourself why because things are going wrong. Ask yourself why even when things are going right. Why am I so happy? My husband and I were talking about that. Like we're just very, you know, in love and gross and we're having so much fun. And we're just like constantly loving on each other. And I'm just like, why are we so happy? Why is everything so great? Why are you so wonderful? And the truth is, is like we work fucking hard to make it that way. It shows every day how much we work to make this marriage a wonderful thing to wake up to every day. And it's so easy, but it's so consistent. And it's probably also why it's easy. But we're working on ourselves, right? The marriage is easy. But we're always got to keep like yesterday. Oh, my God. After stream, I was wiped. My spoons were gone. We were watching anime. And he was like, are you good? I was like, bro, I'm dead. Like my spoons were gone. I'm sorry, Hassan is right. This job is fucking hard. You know, I was just like this. And he's like, you good? I was like, bro, I'm out of spoons, bro. And I just did a six hour stream or whatever. But I was, I was dead. And he like looked at me. And so we turned on anime and we zend out and that's what I needed. And then we did some other things. But like, you know what I'm saying? It was good. But like, it was, it was like we were looking at each other and trying to be there for one another. Which is why Sarah's words are so heartbreaking when she thinks the, 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 when she said like, oh, I thought, I thought we were working on the relationship. We had problems. We, 
But you realize like no matter how hard Sarah would have worked, he was still fucking other people. What was that? Did you guys just hear a noise? I feel like I just heard a noise in my ear. Anyways, no matter how. Oh, I think it's my string. I heard it again. No matter how hard Sarah would have worked on that relationship, he was still cheating. No matter how hard she would have worked on the relationship, he was still lying to her. That drives you crazy, thinking you're making an effort, thinking you're doing everything possible to make a relationship work, only to find out she's been fucking someone else or he's been fucking someone else. That is a devastating betrayal, which is why I think cheating is abusive. I think this is an incredibly abusive situation, right? And I know some people disagree with that, but I don't know how this couldn't be abusive. To gaslight your partner, to convince them they're the problem, like, I'm trying my best. Why are you, why are you, you know, why do you think something's happening? You know how many people I know who will be like, well, yeah, I was cheating, um, but I lied to her about it because I didn't want to hurt her feelings. It's like, is this really about her feelings, though? Or are you just, like, denying accountability? And that's what's so difficult. You want to know how to hold yourself accountable when you've cheated? Hold yourself accountable. Be transparent and honest. Confess your sins to your God, your spouse, your therapist. Face the consequences of your own actions. Oh, I don't want to tell them they'll get their feelings hurt. Sounds like you're trying to save face. You're trying to actually deny yourself the consequence of your actions, which is very human and I totally get that. But when you're ready to take responsibility for the person you are in this moment, Take responsibility because that will be the moment you become a different person. I don't believe once a cheater, always a cheater. But until you stop cheating, hold yourself accountable and become a different person, you're still just a cheater, bro. You're a lying, consent violating cheater. That's what that is. Isn't that amazing though? The moment, truthfully, the literal second you decide. You're going to stop cheating because you've just realized like, oh my God, yeah, I don't want to be this person anymore. That's it. It's over. You're no longer a cheater. And you know in your consciousness, you're having a shift. That's it. The moment you really stop doing it, it's like a breakup. You break up, you get back together, you break up, you get back together, you break up. You know, girls, if you've ever been in this situation, I remember explicitly the moment I knew it was over. I was like, oh my God, it's for real over. And I never called him again, never heard his voice again, never had to deal with him again. And it was the most amazing moment of my life because I had broken up with him before and I knew it wasn't over because I still hoped he'd get better and we would make it work. And, but then I remember the very last moment and boom, I became a different person in that very moment, not literally, but inside conscientiously. I was like, oh, it changed. It's like with the babies thing. For months and months and months and months, I knew one day I was going to wake up and be a person who wasn't going to have bio kids. I just hadn't made the decision yet. And I hadn't become the Brittany who was going to make that decision. And then one day I woke up and I was like, I'm not going to have bio kids, am I? And then you realize like, oh, I've changed. You know, one thing introspection has given me was the ability to notice I was in a moment. One of the tools introspection has given me was to notice that I was changing. Before, I wouldn't even know it was happening. And then one day it would just happen. But now I'm like, oh, I'm watching myself change. I'm like, oh, there I am. I'm growing and I'm shifting and I'm becoming a person that's going to do this thing. I'm like actually watching me change in a moment. Or you know when you're having like a really special moment with someone, you say it out loud like, hey, are we connecting? Like, are we having a moment? Most people don't call it out. Most people have the internal experience inside and don't share it. And I wanted to verbally share it and be like, I am acknowledging that we're having a moment. I think that is one of the coolest tools introspection gave me is to be like, oh, we're in a moment. And that's the same with stress. When you're, you know, stressed out and you're like, life's just really hard. You don't get it. Instead, you can say, oh, dude, I'm in a stress like moment. Okay, let's ride the wave of the stress. Okay, we're in a stress moment. This sucks. I'm going to be stressed. I'm going to be not sleeping and angry and snippy. And when I catch myself doing it, I got to say, it's the stress. It's not you. I love you. It's the stress. It's not you. I love you. 
Instead, what people normally do is go, you're fucking pissing me off and I'm stressed and you're the reason I'm mad. But when you're aware that you're stressed, you should now be aware that your body is shooting off a lot of fucking chemicals and all these other things that's making you snap at people. And you got to be able to say, oh, it's not you. It's the stress. I love you. It's not you. It's the stress. I love you. But most people can't do that because they don't even know it's the stress. They know they're stressed, but they actually think their partner's pissing them off by being the same old partner they've always been. Your partner's not pissing you off. You're just pissed off. You're pissed off at their breathing. You ever hear that stereotype? Uh, my wife picked a fight with me because of the way I breathed. It's not because of the way you breathed, but it is something. And you got to know what it is. And the fact that people don't think, I should probably find out what the fuck that is. Instead, they go, ah, she's a woman. You know women. They get mad at you for just breathing. Do you think that's you practicing introspection, bro? Extrospection? No. Introspection would be like, what am I doing, if anything? Extrospection would be like, why does she snap at me when I breathe? Don't I care about my wife enough to know, to figure it out, to help her figure it out? And same. For the wife, why are you snapping at your husband because he's breathing loud? Why are you doing that? Nobody gets to that point where they ask themselves because it's kind of embarrassing. Lakara says, I do that with my best friend often. Like, we're having such a good moment. We're such good friends. And he's like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love it when I call my bestie and we're really having a moment. I'm like, ooh, girl, we haven't had one of these in a while. Because, like, I'll talk to my besties. And then sometimes you talk to your bestie and you're like reminiscing about life and you're having like a real moment. You're like, ooh, we haven't had one of these in a while. I love these. Sometimes I'll catch up with my sister and I'm like, ooh, we're really having a good convo right now. We're having like an intimate. Now imagine you're having all those great moments and the person is cheating or stealing or kicking your dog. It's fucking a horrible betrayal, bro. You think you're really having a moment. You're vibing. You're loving somebody. And then you find out they're fucking behind your back doing something so cruel, bro. That's fucked up. That's fucked up. That's not the kind of, that's not the kind of activity I would call good. But you can call it good if you'd like. I don't think it's good to go behind someone's back. I don't think it's good to lie about people. I don't think it's good to cheat on people. I don't think it's good to steal people's money. I don't think any of these things are good. If you're doing those things, I hope you become a person who doesn't anymore. But that's up to you, isn't it? It's really up to you. You are so powerful. You actually get to decide if you want to be that person or not. Which is really sad when you do choose to be that person. But then the nuanced take is how much free will are they actually evoking to make a different decision? Depending on who you ask, they would say little to none or all of it. In my head, in real life, while I'm dead, my belly's being fed, and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine. Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed, so why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking. Yeah. Sick of reaching out for the truth and living life as a fool. Dun, 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 dun.